Andy Raymond joins us. It may not have been technically the greatest game of rugby league ever played since 1908. Who cares? It was terrific theatre. It was emotion. It yeah. was passion. It was shuffle forward in your seat every moment of the game because something else crazy could have happened. I bloody loved it. Hey, are you, Andy Raymond, Unfiltered Man's podcast? We welcome you back to the program, sir. Hello, legend. How are we this week? Very well, thank you. And kicking it off with a big biff that happened on NRL 360 last night. So this is the discussion point. Here's my quick thoughts on it before I ask you about it. Simply that, look, I've flipped and flopped over this. To start with, I used to think that Kiwi players should be eligible, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, hell no, back the truck here. This is an Aussie competition. It's more than that. It's actually a state competition. It's either New South Wales or it's Queensland. And if you declare to play for one of those places. You're declaring that you are either New South Welshman or you're a Queenslander, in which case, to me, that obligation is you then play for Australia. What are your thoughts? I'm going to start by saying I don't believe Suran Suran shot Bobby Kennedy and I don't believe Lee Harvey Oswald shot John F. Kennedy. I am not a conspiracy theorist, however. But I just think what they've raised last night on NRL 360 is something that everyone's been talking about uh, and that they've tried to sensationalise it, uh, as they do on that program. And, and it's, a, it's now a program that I, I just don't watch. I, I, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy the sensationalism. I don't enjoy the headline-seeking. So as a result of complaining, I uh, my, my vote is just by watching something else. What, I'm a bit like you. I used to think anyone and everyone should be able to play state of origin, um, but the, the parameters have changed. Uh, the game has changed. The makeup of who plays the game has changed. And what we've seen happen this year, again, it's caught the NRL unawares, but... The eligibility of state of origin has now got to come under question. It it really does. I I don't think you can have it both ways. I don't think you can play for New South Wales or Queensland and then declare, well, I don't want to play for Australia. Playing for New South Wales and Queensland back in the day, back when we first started watching state of origin, it was state of origin in its own right, but it was also a selection game for the Australian side. So something's got to give. You can't have it one way, you can't have it the other way. But if you say, in Australia anyway, if you say um, you should be able to play State of Origin and play for Samoa, you're branded as a racist. So it's a very delicate topic. It's a topic that uh, is going to have to be discussed and discussed at great length with... Not only players, but cultural leaders um, and and smart people, not just footy people, because we have got so many players, and rightfully so, that they cannot wait, and they are going to be so proud to represent their home nation. And I reckon that's bloody fabulous. I really do. That strengthens the international game. It's not going to weaken State of Origin because there will be another player ready for State of Origin. Make no mistake about that. But you you can't have it both ways. I I firmly believe that. And if that means increasing um, the Polynesian representative calendar every single year um, to complement State of Origin or to go hand in hand with State of Origin, even better. Even better. I'd love that. I'd love that. It's long been spoken about North Island versus South Island in New Zealand. Now, whether logistically that works and whether it's a fair game or or whether whether it's, um, you know, some other rules and regulations, but, uh, you know, a New Zealand equivalent of state of origin, I'd love that as well. Uh, So a lot of thoughts got to go into this and everyone's got to play it for mine, cool, 
and sensibly and not try and just get a headline okay. out of it. I understand. Look, I understand all of that. You've added another couple of layers to it. I'm, I, I, I'm thrilled at the idea of Tor Samoa and Mate Ma'a Tonga having really competitive teams that are a genuine shot at the Rugby League World Cup. We've seen the same in rugby as well, where, let's call them the Tier yep. 1 nations, but the Northern Hemisphere, and we've, we're guilty as hell in New Zealand of just pillaging the islands for their players and so forth. And the whole thing about rugby is in 1991, Manu Samoa got to the quarterfinals of the Rugby World Cup. Now, that was meant to be yep. the revolution that opened all the doors. Well, since then, you have a look at the state of rugby in Manu Samoa. Has it really improved in 30 years? No, it hasn't. Because all of us nations no. all wanted their best players, but the idea that these countries actually get competitive, oh, we don't like that. And I think with Australia, that you know, that the whole thing about it was that the Kangaroos have been the number one, the number one, the number one, and Australian Rugby League wants the Kangaroos to retain that and be the number one. The, you know, I think that perhaps what Origin has got to realise is that maybe you won't be able to select the 34 best players. Maybe you will be able to select the 34 best New South Welshmen and Queenslanders and take it back to that, which was what it was meant to be. Because I also feel on the other side of the argument that for a young guy like uh, Suali, who's, who sparked that debate last night, uh, he was born in Australia, so he's Australian, but his obviously familial origin is back to the islands in Samoa, and he wants to represent them. I understand that. But the way the current rules are, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And I kind of feel that if he was asked and put in a position which says you can play for Manu Samoa, sorry, um, Tor Samoa at the World Cup, but that means that you're not going to play origin again, he'd probably take the origin and the cash because, hey, we're all in it to make money as well, aren't we? There is layer upon layer of this, Andy, and I think you, you're really thoughtful the way that you've actually said what you've said and the fact that it has to be debated and it's got to be debated calmly and reasonably with with voices that aren't there to create headlines. I absolutely acknowledge all of that, mate. Mate, you, you've hit the nail on the head here and if I'm going to be really honest, you hit the nail on the head. It's about cash. It's about cash for the players. Now, I'll present this argument to you. When State of Origin was kicking off and, and uh, it was dominating, it was the 1980s. Mark Graham... Gary Freeman, Olsen Philippina, Clayton Friend, all playing in Australia. None of them ever put their hand up or argued that they should be playing State of Origin. Why? Because they were New Zealanders and State of Origin was an Australian thing. These days, the young athletes are on massive dollars and they want everything and they don't want anyone to say no to them. So look at that, look at that logically. Maybe it's just different people, different eras, or maybe it's, it's where we are as a society. Look, and there's no easy answer. That's what you're saying to me. I mean, I think that... No, you know, it's not. That, you know, I mean, I, I always wanted to see Sonny Bill play State of Origin, as did everyone, you know, who, who loved State of Origin. They wanted to see that. But ultimately, you know, what we've got to realise, and, and all the players have got to realise, that it is a New South Wales, Queensland competition only, or it's not. So, you know, everything about it has to change. Okay, and, and I didn't actually I didn't actually realise that that was part of the deal, was that's what that programme was meant to do, which in some ways I do applaud because the programmes we have here in New Zealand, my mate, are so goddamn boring and sterile and sugar-coated yeah. and there is no argument. You know, and if somebody's trying to create a headline or create a debate, that's also what we do in this business as well, so I acknowledge that. Let us go to the other NRL story, though, which is your beloved Eels... They turned up last Friday night, mate. I'm watching the TV. I'm hoping in hell they're going to absolutely bottle it and choke it. And I'm looking at this team going, this team looks as though I could win the comp. Amazing. Um, we, which doesn't augur well for this weekend because <laughs> they've had their one week on. So That's exactly it. might it. be Sleepy's time this week. It might be Sleepy's time this week. Who would know what you get from the Parramatta Eels? And of the final four teams left, they are the most inconsistent side. Therefore... The other three coaches suggesting they're probably the most dangerous side because you don't, you just don't know what you're going to get. You can read Souths, you can read Penrith, and you can read North Queensland to a degree. Geez, it'd be hard getting a read on Parramatta and which Parramatta turn up and, and which style they're going to play. So uh, it might make a, a little bit of an uncomfortable week for Todd Payton and the Cowboys. Uh, two great games this weekend. Mm. Really looking forward to them, mate. Really looking forward to them. I hope they're better games and better spectacles than we, we had last weekend. Not that they were bad games, but the, the scoreline blew yeah, the out. Yeah, the blowouts, yeah. The blowouts, yeah. Wasn't yeah. There. The, yeah. That, that theatre from the week before that we that we spoke about last week where you, you didn't know what was going to happen and, and it 
one try separated, and that's why we love sport like we do. Um, so it wasn't the greatest semi-final week ever last week, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we got two cracker games leading into a big grand final. Panthers Cowboys on this. I mean, again, that that question is: It good to have rested for a week? I mean, the Eels and the South players have absolutely thrashed themselves. But when you look at the way that they played last week, good lord, if they carry that form, if they kick off like a rocket like that in the first ten minutes, I mean, that's what they've both got to bring, don't they? They've got to sit set these two seeds back on their heels early. They they do, and the whole week off thing. Um, I'm really yet to be convinced if it's good or if it's bad. Uh, Sure, your little niggling injuries and no one gets suspended and no one gets hurt even more. Um, But I think we look at the week off either as an excuse or a reason post-match. Once the result is... Once we know the result, then we start throwing darts at, at, uh, at that damn week off and look what it did and look at the advantage or the disadvantage it was. Um, I know for a fact that Parramatta, all fit and healthy, uh, well, as fit and healthy as you can be for this time of the year, that there, there are bumps and bruises, there are niggles, there's a lot of time in physio, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but no excuses at this time of year, and even if there was excuses, it doesn't matter. There's, there's two games to go. It's elimination football, and... Uh, Re- you get beaten now with a reason, not an excuse. Andy Raymond unfiltered his man's podcast. I'm going to talk to you about the Bledisloe Cup test and that swine, a swine, swain in a second. But introducing a brand new phrase into the sporting vernacular, we had a side selected today for the All Blacks. Uh, really um, eyebrow raising and quite confusing some of these selections. And the selectors turned around and said to us that the reason we've matriculated the numbers. So what you get now, my ah. we, we've matriculated. So what you get now is the dietitian, the statistician, the nutrition and the sports scientists come and they matriculate the numbers and according to the VO capacity bollocks index, this player can't play this week because the numbers say. I'm not joking you, mate. I think I heard Homer Simpson use that word <laughs> on an early episode. <laughs> Matriculated. Matriculated. You've got... So, I mean, these people need a slap, don't they? What do you mean? I'm the coach. I know whether he plays or not. No, I've matriculated the numbers coach. He can't play. That, yeah. Look, some people... You know what it is? It's someone trying to justify their job. There you go. Someone on the sports science department of the All Blacks trying to justify their job, and they've gone to the coach and said, now, here's a word... Here's a reason. Mm-hmm. Run with this champion and you'll look like a superstar. That's it. Shut up. It is a dead. You just want to say shut up, don't you? I mean, look, yes, at, you at these do. days, you get, these day, the players can't play 80 minutes. Oh, they can't do that these days. I mean, and they can't even play back-to-back tests. I'm sorry, but when you go to the World Cup, the quarterfinal and the semifinal are what? They're back-to-back, Andy. I mean, yeah, a, that's, that's exactly right. You know? I mean, you've got, it's you've got exactly players that play right. Origin and play three days later for their club sides. And what are those numbers matriculated? That, are they? Yeah, no, they're, they're un, see. That's where you fall. That's where yeah, you're letting yourself down, down Marty. Yeah. They're, they're unmatriculated numbers. <laughs> no, see, I think those that matriculate also masturbate. That's what I'm saying right now, and I think that that's that really is the only truth when it comes. But let's go back to the Bledisloe Cup, mate. Moan to me about the French ref and tell us that it was unjustified, and tell us that you know that he got it wrong. Hold on, I'm just going to take my time in answering this. I'm going to be a little bit like a wallaby. I'm just going to take my time. Uh, what was that? Bernard Foley. So what is, an, what an earth. Look, hey, we said, um, you know, wouldn't it be good if they, if it was a game that created headlines and it was theatre and it was engaging? And look, it was. It really was uh, disappointing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, so much history there. Um, Would it have meant the world to the Aussies? Yes, it would have. But, you know, in a really, in a a funny way, it's almost like a win. That's what, that's how we've seen it over this side of the ditch. It's almost like a win. Uh, A great deal of confusion. A lot of finger pointing. Uh, If I'm going to be serious, you just don't put yourself in that position. Yeah, as a player, as a professional, as a group of professionals, you don't even you don't even push a referee. Yeah. Um, you know, at that time in that field position. So, uh, you know, yeah, the the French referee, they've got a history of being bizarre. We know that, but you know, I think the Wallabies let themselves down. I really do. 
I think the judiciary let itself down too. Darcy Swain, six weeks for that. Here's a chance to actually... Oh, look, you know, you've got everyone... All eyeballs are on that decision, aren't they? They're parents with kids wanting to play yep. rugby. They're fans, they're sponsors, they're broadcasters. Everyone's eyeballing it. And once again, six weeks, of course, which four or five of that gets absorbed, the Australian A2, which they conveniently named him for, and so effectively he gets yeah. to go. I mean, mate, we're all, see, we're all seeing the same pile of stinking poop, aren't we? It made exactly the same as with, the, you know, the Rugby League World Cup there, but... You know, there was a couple of suspensions with Lindsay Collins and Jared Warrior Hargreaves, both from the Roosters. And Lindsay and Jared are both able to serve uh, portions of their suspensions at different time in the warm-up or early games of the World Cup. So, um, yeah, whilst it's whilst it's important to have a, a set of rules, I think it, it seems to be at the moment, it's more important to have a little bit of flexibility in the rules to suit the game. I want to just mention the Hawthorne story. I don't want to even talk about it. What I read about it is just uh, uh, the same reaction as you. I mean, what what can you say about, oh, my God, I hope this isn't true. I just hope this isn't true, and it is true. We as a nation are collectively holding our breath here. Um, the headlines have disgusted us. Mm. The suggestions and the rumours have appalled us. Um, it's 2022, for God's sake. Yeah, it's 2022. Yeah, and not suggesting this behaviour is currently going on. Not, you know, not that you would ever know that it is or it isn't, but in recent <clears throat> history that this crap has continued. Yeah, man. J- just, just unacceptable. And it... it, it on makes every level, sick, like, yeah, it is. It's just sickening, isn't it? Makes me embarrassed. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's Revolving, finish on a real mate. positive, mate, because um, I loved your tweet the other day, which I retweeted. Andy Raymond unfiltered is the man's podcast, and you had Roycey on. And look, I mean, I was never a fan of the Penrith Panthers, but that you know those grand finals over those years where they were involved, and MG, who's a great mate, catching it, and Roycey getting that try and going absolutely berserk and everything, and the fact that you got to have a chat, you got to chat with him. I just thought it was fantastic. A lot of. Um a lot of media this week about a story that Channel 7 ran on a current affair program with Mario Fennec, who... Yes. Um, the old North Sydney the beer boy, as eh? as anyone. Yeah. yeah, and it, look, it was a really emotional, terrible story. Uh, Roy Simmons, at 62 years of age, has been diagnosed with early-onset dementia. Um, I've had a wonderful relationship with Roy for 30-something years. He, he was wonderful with me in one of my very first interviews as a teenager, and I've never forgotten his uh, his good nature. And we sat down and we, we discussed his career and his life, uh, and the career, obviously, with the Premiership in 1991 as his, as his final game. But we spoke in depth about uh, the early onset dementia, his future, the impact, the impact on the families, um, it's a very emotional issue. It's it's very topical because what we know now about the human brain and collision sports um, is very different to what you and I grew up yeah, man. believing, totally. Marty. It was a badge of honour to keep playing. It was. a badge of honour to play the next week. Um, and Royce, I think, is probably going to be the start of uh, a generation of mature age guys that played rugby league and rugby union at an elite level that are going to pay for pay for their career in the latter years of their lives um, oh man an amazing interview mate it really is and you don't even have to be a sports fan to to listen to it it's it's raw and emotional look forward to talking to you again my brother next week hey eh? thanks so much for that as always we'll do it then bud Andy Raymond Unfiltered is the man's podcast.